even if you're born in the light, like, like I kind of was, I was being born into Christianity. I was born into the light, shall we say. It wasn't, it was a perfect world that needed to crumble and crash. But I had to walk through paths of darkness to reach the light. And even now I'm not sure, am I in the light? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Um, I'm struggling lately, if I'll be really honest. Um, I just, I, I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm doing kind of thing. And I, I'm tired of it, honestly. It's like all the, all the personal growth and all the, and all the spiritual seeking and all the wandering. And I feel like I'm just right back to where I started <laughs> kind of right now. And it's just like, well, this sucks. And but at the same time, it's wonderful. And at the same time, it's boring. I, I mean, I've got, I'm extremely at peace, but I've got so much goddamn peace, I'm fucking bored. <laughs> like it's, it's just this really weird place I'm in right now. And I'm trying to figure out, well, what do I do and where do I go and what do I want? And who knows? Hello, spiritual seekers and fellow wanderers. I'm Mark, as always, your host and creator of this mess that is this channel. University for Wanderers slash Think Spiritual slash whatever the hell it is. I'm not trying to create a brand. I don't care anymore. <laughs> no, I, I don't mean that I don't care. I mean that, that, that I don't care about creating a brand. So I won't go on that rabbit trail at the moment. Uh, but... Speaking of rabbits, so I'm going to tell you about my, not just my favorite novels today, but the novels that influenced me throughout a lot of my formative years and that have influenced my thinking and that have sort of aided me along my own spiritual journey. I'm not going to start with, you know, the least influential and work my way up to the most info. No, I, I'm going to start with the most influential one, but just my little bit of preamble that I always have to put into all my videos because I just preamble and things like that, because all of this stuff is related in my brain and I have to get it out. Reading was my thing for most of my life. I actually didn't really get into movies and such until, let's say, maybe 12, 13, 14 years ago sort of thing. I mean, I always had, like, my few favorite movies, but I never really, like, they never became my influencing force, shall we say, until, like, let's just say the last 10 years or so. Uh, and part of that was because uh, it was really about my eyesight, actually. I can't read, it's really sad for me, I can't read novels anymore. I can't read books. I need my Kindle. Now, I have a Kindle, and the text has to be relatively large for me to uh, read it at all. So, and I, I need good light and good large text to read. I cannot read the novels I love so much. I used to read voraciously. I used to read at pretty much at least a book a week. So this first book, I read it for the first time. Uh, we'll just we'll just get right into it. I read it for the first time when I was 13 years old, which is uh, my mother wrote in there, wrote her name. It was her book, uh, uh, and she has 1987 in there. That was uh, I was 13 years old in 1987. I still have the copy. It's falling apart, and. Uh, I read that book every single year for 20 years. Every single year I read it at least once for 20 years. But I just finished reading it again on Kindle. Uh, I just finished reading it again a few months ago. And this time, every time I read it, I get something new out of it. And maybe you'll laugh. Well, I don't care if you laugh. I don't care what you think. It's considered as a children's book, but for children to read it and get anything, you know, meaningful out of it, 
And, I mean, there was a movie made out of it, and the movie, you know, traumatizes all his children, too. It's Watership Down. This is my all-time absolute favorite book. It has influenced me in so many different ways. I get something new out of it every single time I read it. Every single time. It has... Uh, it's a commentary on society, on societies. It's a commentary on uh, our inner workings. Uh, when I read it this last time, I absolutely, finally... So I, I never ever thought of it in terms of the hero's journey or the heroine's journey uh, before I read it this time, just because it's been quite a while since I read it. Um, as I said, this one is falling apart. It's It's got a good chunk in the middle here that just <laughs> comes out <laughs> I have multiple copies of it actually and have to have it on Kindle now I'd never really thought of it in terms of the heroes and heroines journey because I hadn't really read it since starting this project uh, but this time, this last time that I read it, I really really saw it in that view I really saw uh, the character of Hazel, I love Hazel, absolutely love Hazel. He's a wonderful character. If the book was written today, that would probably be a feminine character, that would probably be a female character. He is he is a feminine character in this book, regardless of his gender, again. He is the heroine. He is on the heroine's journey to, to discover and to become that chief rabbit. And uh, Bigwig is the hero. Bigwig is... Bigwig has to go down into his shadow and face General Woundwart, the 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 the, the beast fearful of uh, fe fearful of dying, fearful of everything, uh, and Bigwig has to go down into that shadow realm to basically fight that shadow version of himself, the thing that he could become were he to follow uh, his fearful his fears and his desire for power instead of allowing Hazel to become the rabbit he needs to be. And it, remember it takes a long big wig actually says, he says the day I stop the day I call you chief rabbit will be the day I stop fighting. He says, that'll be the day. And really it's kind of true. It's like the very last fight that big wig has. He calls Hazel his chief chief rabbit and that's his acknowledgement that he is not going to go down the path of General Woundwort. He is not going to become another Woundwort. So uh, I really, really saw that this time and just that dual journey and uh, how Bigwig has his journey, how Hazel has his journey. I absolutely adore the final scene with Hazel, the epilogue, where Elorera comes to him at the end of end of his life and takes him away. Uh, I love the way they portrayed that in the movie, even. I, I love it in the book. I love it in the movie, that scene. Uh, it's phenomenal. The movie I never liked as a kid. I, I, I didn't I didn't understand it and I didn't uh, and now I watch the movie and I go, oh, it's actually really close to the book. They just have a few little details here and there that they've either cut details out that is like, yeah, we can leave those out and added a couple of little things that just to sort of emphasize to the audience what's happening. Um, I actually don't mind the old movie now. I actually quite like it. I, I've watched it numerous times and it's not... As a child, yes, it was traumatizing because it's so unexpected kind of thing. The violence and everything is so unexpected as a child and relatively real in one sense in it. But this is, yeah, this is the book that has probably influenced me throughout my life more than I would even understand that it has. Uh, even from an early age, I recognize the societal parallels and the societal allegory that it has, but I think it has much more than that, and I think it's obviously, I think it's impacted me even more than I can say. So that is the number one book in my life.
as I said, I read, you know, at least a book a week, basically, for most of my life. I have forgotten more books <laughs> than I remember, let's put it that way. And I don't own near as many as I, I, I used to have, and I just have one small shelf of the books that I enjoy having and that I want to keep. Um, what, what do I want to go with here? The next most influential or... Uh, I'm just going to go with uh, actually the series that I just read for fun right now. The series that I enjoy reading most for fun is uh, Kim Harrison's The Hollow series. Uh, this was this was supposed to be the last one. She was she was thinking that it's like, oh, I think I'm done with this character in this series. And no, lo and behold, she's carried it on. Uh, probably better for her pocketbook too that she does. So <laughs> I think, I think most unfortunately most of her other novels I don't think they did that well in monetary terms. Um, so the rest I get on anything after this I'm getting on Kindle. So because I have to basically this was the last one I was actually able to physically read. That's the one I read for fun and enjoyment mostly. The urban fantasy genre in general I really enjoy, but hers are the best in my opinion um partly because it seems like a lot of urban fantasy uh whether you know whether we're talking about the dresden files or simon r green's novels or uh any other uh, let's even throw dean Koontz into some of those with odd thomas and wh whatever and uh it seems like a lot of those a lot of the characters, a lot of the main characters are very, uh, they're, they're very self-righteous, it seems to me, uh, in, in regards to how they treat their enemies. Um, and it's always sort of tit for tat. It's like, you did this, so I'm the karmic response, and now you're going to have the same thing done back to you kind of thing. That's what it seems like a lot of those other characters and authors have done with those books. Whereas Kim Harrison doesn't do that. Uh, she, uh, Rachel Morgan is not the karmic justice for whatever the current enemy is. Sometimes it's not even necessarily an enemy that has to be taken down physically. Quite often it is. Quite often it is. And sometimes, and it's not that she doesn't commit violent acts or whatever, but it's not her, it's not her go-to method she's always trying some other method the the character um, and miss harrison writes relationships between characters very very well very very well i don't know they're really good i really enjoy those and sometimes i mean there's little nuggets of wisdom in them the last one that i read uh, had a few lines in there that really twigged on me that i kind of wrote down and i'm gonna just briefly hit upon so when i was still a christian uh, I, I didn't read, um, what shall I say? When I stepped outside of the bounds of Christian fiction, uh, it wasn't really stuff that was, shall we say, necessarily hugely thought-provoking or really made me uncomfortable or anything. But there were two series that I read that definitely challenged my thinking. Let's put it that way. And those two series were Arthur C. Clarke's Rama series, the four books, uh, and James P. Hogan's Giants novels. Those two books were really, really, really challenged my thinking and really made me uncomfortable when I was a Christian. And I haven't read them since that time, but they stick in my brain. And so I think I need to get them on the Kindle and read them again and probably have a very new appreciation for them since I've left that religion uh, since that time. But those ones, they, they stuck in my brain. I did finish reading them. I, I didn't want to finish reading the Rama series, but it stuck in my brain and it's like, I have to finish. I have to finish this. I have to finish this. I have to finish this. So one of probably the... <laughs> Maybe one of the greatest sci-fi books ever written. Maybe one of the greatest books ever written. Uh, Ender's Game. I read this, I don't know how many times. Maybe a few dozen. Maybe not a, not a few dozen. I have not read it as much as Watership Down, but probably at least 
I, I've probably read it a dozen times. And I just recently read, again on the Kindle, just recently, finally read uh, Ender's Shadow. And I wasn't going to, I actually wasn't going to read sort of the other Ender books. I kind of, I, I did read the Ender series in general. Uh, Xenocide plus the rest, whatever the rest are called. I can't remember now. Uh, but I wasn't really interested in the other side uh, the Earth story, Peter's story, Shadow of the Hegemon, things like that. Uh, until I found out that Ender's Shadow is literally, literally Ender's game told from Bean's perspective. And once I, once I had, once I understood that, I was like, oh, that would be actually really interesting. So I read it. It was really interesting. And that's where the Heroes and Heroines journey lies. In this book is Heroines Journey, Ender's Shadow is Hero's Journey. So that if, if I had a copy of Ender's, then I would put them like this. <laughs> so it's, but if you want to see the perspective, Bean is definitely the hero, cut off from his emotions, cut off from his family, all of this kind of thing. Completely, completely the mirror image of Ender. Ender, the reason they, the military wants Ender is, like I said, they said Peter was too harsh, Valentine was too soft, and they needed that one in the middle. They needed that heroine. They needed to use, I'll say her, they needed to use her to achieve their goals. They needed to strip her of everything that she was and then she needs to go on the journey to find herself at the end of it all and where the other books are even. So, uh, I, I don't relate to Ender in regards to being the child genius, but I relate to a lot of the feelings and emotions and the things that he goes through. Uh, it's just a phenomenally written book. The movie is <laughs> how do I politely say travesty? Um, it's not a travesty. It's I mean the movie gets all the core components correct, but it's like it's this living corpse basically. It's it's like it it looks like Ender's Game. It feels like Ender's Game. It kind of, you know, does all the things that at an Ender's Game movie should kind of do, but it's got literally no soul. It's just the the life and soul is sucked out of it. Even by making Ender and the children too old, twice the age that they should have been. Like that movie, like this book, it should shock you. It should horrify you. It should inspire you. It should make you feel like that's the thing with this book. It makes you feel the gamut of emotions. It makes you feel everything. And that's what the movie should do. The movie makes you feel basically nothing. The movie more or less makes you feel nothing. And it should make you feel everything. You should, you, you should be horrified and angry and uh, uh, feel inspired and awed like all in one kind of thing. And that's what this book does. That's what the movie should have done. And they just didn't get it right. Basically. Uh, because they wimped out on making the children younger. That's really what it was. And by taming the violence down a, a series that has influenced me again in ways I don't even understand that I read time and time again, and get something new out of it. And every time I read it too, it's like, oh, I relate to this character this time. Oh, I relate to this character this time. Oh, this time I relate to this character. Yeah. Uh, and this is the last book in the series. There's seven books in the series. Uh, this is The Death Gate Cycle by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. And I, I mentioned this years ago on a forum uh, and somebody said, oh, it's like I liked those books when I was 15. It's just like, oh, okay, good for you, you arrogant twat. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't care. I, I, I will love them till I die. So, 
And that's the thing with books. Don't let anybody tell you that they're, you know, these books are too young for you or anything like that. Uh, I, I know people who just read YA novels and YA novels can be, can be good. There's a lot of really good ones out there. So it's, uh, but the, the death gate cycle, it impacts me every time I read it. Uh, the whole series is really good. Um, I mean, I, I felt like I was haplo at one point. I felt like, I, I feel like I'm Alfred now is what I feel like now. I feel, I feel like I'm Alfred. <laughs> Uh, you know, maybe next time I read it, maybe it's like, oh, maybe I'll feel like Hugh the Hand. I don't know. It's, it's so good. It's so good. Uh, I, again, hero, heroine. I mean, Haplo, definitely the hero. Alfred, definitely the heroine. Like, no question. Uh, you, you have to watch each of those characters go on their respective journeys, come around to meeting in the middle, and... And, uh, 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 what's his name? Zifnab. <laughs> Zifnab. I love Zifnab. Uh, phenomenal. Thinks he's God at the end. Maybe he's not wrong. <laughs> That's the thing. It just, and I think the very, the, again, it was a series that I read when I was a Christian for the first time. And it, it got to the end like that. And, how and it just said but it's like I, I was just like but it's not oh like there it's not over like it's it's not done like it's and now I look at that and just go yeah it's not over it's not done isn't that wonderful <laughs> like it's <laughs> but when I found the death gate cycle I had not heard of of, of Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman I had no idea who they were I didn't know about uh the Dragonlance series and all that stuff and I actually found out about them first through, just through Margaret Weiss. I love this series. I love it, like, more than almost anything. Uh, almost, almost more than uh, Watership Down, just about. Uh, this is the Star of the Guardian series, just by Margaret Weiss. No Tracy Hickman involved. Uh, it's, it's, it's Star Wars, but it's not. It, it's Star Wars with, with class. Um, this is, this is not sci-fi. It's, 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 it's space fantasy. Let's put it that way. Uh, and it's just, it's, it, it's amazing. It really is amazing. Uh, I, I am torn as to who the hero and who the heroine are in this. I mean, uh, the, the boy to be king, Dion, definitely could be heroine. Uh, uh, Tusk definitely could be hero. I mean, for sure. But then there's Maigret, Lady Maigret and Lord Sagan, and just their journey. The, this, these, the, the, this series in general is the... This, this is what really brought in my mind... This, the idea that's always circling is that um, the line in the book is two together must walk the paths of darkness to reach the light. And that phrase has always rung in my head and always been, yeah, to reach the light, you have to walk through paths of darkness. Uh, like you can't, you can't get there without it kind of thing. Even if you're born in the light, like, like I kind of was, I was being born into Christianity. I was born into the light, shall we say. It wasn't. It was a perfect world that needed to crumble and crash. But I had to walk through paths of darkness to reach the light. And even now, I'm not sure, am I in the light? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Um, I'm struggling lately, if I'll be really honest. Um I just, I, I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm doing kind of thing. And I, I'm tired of it, honestly. It's like all the, all the personal growth and all the, and all the spiritual seeking and all the wandering. And I feel like I'm just right back to where I started <laughs> kind of right now. And it's just like, well, this sucks. And, but at the same time, it's wonderful, and at the same time, it's boring. 
I, I mean, I've got, I'm extremely at peace, but I've got so much goddamn peace, I'm fucking bored. <laughs> like, it's, it's just this really weird place I'm in right now. And I'm trying to figure out, well, what do I do and where do I go and what do I want and who knows? So anyway, and that's what this whole book series feels like, I guess. And maybe I need to read it. Well, I mean, I just read it a little while ago, but maybe I need to read it again. So this is my original copy. It's held up marvelously well for how many times I read it. Uh, I bought it. Okay, when did I buy these? Uh, would have been mid-90s. Would have been mid-90s. Still a Christian at the time. I bought this in, I, I remember like buying this. There, it was the, um, it was the first, the, the, the store is chapters, uh, chapters slash indigo, it became indigo. Uh, so chapters, it was the first one that opened in, uh, Vancouver because I was living there at the time and I had walked to the mall and the chapters and I was just like, oh, and I was just absolutely enthralled because like it was so huge. We just had little tiny bookstores up in Canada f since, since then. But chapters was like the book mega store. And I would I would just walk to the mall and spend hours in the bookstore. So I came across this, bought it, read it. And I was just like, I, I can't I can't read anymore. It's like this is dis this is too disturbing. Like this is, you know, there's there's bad language, there's sex, there's you know, all this kind of stuff in it. Is is just it was a book that I felt like as a Christian, it's like, oh I can't read this. I couldn't get it out of my head. I ha I had had to go buy the next one. I went and bought the next one. It's like, oh I can't read, you know, I had to go buy the next one. There, there's four books. Had to go buy them all. Had to buy them all. Bought them all, read them all, loved them all. I uh, didn't want to admit I love them all, but I love them all. Um, and then there's even, uh, and then there's, uh, there's three, there's three kind of sequels that take place in the same universe and are just uh, from other characters, bounty hunters that are in the, so, and, and these are awesome. I really wish she'd write more of these. Um, yeah. Meg Force 7. That's the sequel novels. If you just want swashbuckling fun that's those ones uh but that series influenced me a lot it it really makes you question what's good what's evil because even the character at the beginning lord sagan who really starts as yeah this is the bad guy this is the evil guy and then it turns out no there's there's something underneath that right like it's it's it, i mean it's exactly like you know, in Star Wars where it's like, yeah, Vader's the bad guy. Vader's the, oh, 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 oh. Then you get to Return of the Jedi and it's like, oh, there's the Emperor. So even though you kind of see that in Empire, but like you don't at the same time. And it's just like, no, Vader's the bad guy. Vader's the bad guy. Oh, the, oh, the Emperor's the bad guy. Oh, oh, Vader's not really the bad guy. Oh, Vader's a puppet <laughs> like kind of thing. And it's sort of that same. I mean, this vi this is very much... Star Wars, very much so, but very much not so. Star Wars to a much greater depth and understanding and much more complex. Very, very complex Star Wars, let's put it that way. Star Wars is simple. This is much better. <laughs> if you are a fan of The Mandalorian and if you're a fan of Halo... Now, I know that there's kind of a group of people that are responsible for creating the lore and uh, just the backstory of those series and those things. But there is one author who actually wrote the novels that created the backstory for Halo and for The Mandalorian, i.e. Uh, Republic Commando. So if you go to the Star Wars Republic Commando series... And if you go to some of the early Halo novels, there is one author that's responsible for all that back lore and all that backstory, and that's Karen Travis. And Karen Travis also wrote her own books before and had them published before any of those other series came out. And uh, people have asked her, it's like, well, don't you want to keep writing your own? She's just like, well, Star Wars and all these other series... Uh, she's become prolific in, I think she was even writing for Gears of War and stuff. I'm not sure. I can't remember now. But 
she says it's like, well, it pays my bills and it made me a number one selling author because her own books, her own books should have made her a number one selling author. But I mean, they're very complex and they're very, anyway, it's this series. First book is City of Pearl. The series, uh, it doesn't actually have a specific title, but I call it the West Har Wars. I think that's the closest. I think I saw it listed as that once was the West Har Wars series. Um, so, what is it, six or seven books? I can't remember. I have them all. I'm just only showing you one at a time, because otherwise I'd have this pile sitting here. Anyway, same author who has written all the backstory and all the back lore for these phenomenal series. Uh, this is her own work. It's very ideological in a lot of ways. There's a lot of ideology, a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of the idea that it's like, oh, we should be able to create a perfect world kind of thing. But it's so well done and it's always showing, it's like, what's the other side of this picture? What's, you know, it's like, yes, we have this ideology. Does it work? Can it work? That's the, that's kind of the questions that she's asking throughout it all. It's really complex, really good sci-fi kind of a mix between hard sci-fi and just relationship stories so it's kind of a good mix of that um yeah i couldn't i can't recommend that series enough if you can still find it i don't know if it's in print still even no clue pretty sure it'd be on kindle okay and there's two uh, i'm gonna call them christian christian series they're kind of not, but I mean, most people would consider them as such. So there's two Christian series that I would recommend as well that I read a lot, got a lot out of, have influenced me a lot that I still read, that I still enjoy. Chronicles of Narnia, all seven books. Excellent. I can't recommend them enough. You can read them. They're, they're easy to read. They're wonderful to read. Worth reading. Beautiful stories. Uh, and the Song of Albion by Stephen Lawhead. Technically, technically, they're Christian. And especially at the end, he kind of wraps it all up in this kind of, and sort of relates it to the uh, to the salvation story, sort of, kind of. But it doesn't, in my mind, it's like that never mattered. It didn't, it didn't really. The last time I read the books, I was just like, how does that even, it's like, that doesn't even fit. <laughs> like, it doesn't, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Stephen Lawhead was a, was slash is a Christian writer, but I'm not so sure. I don't know. I, I yeah, I'll, I'll leave that out of it as to whether he actually is or not. It's just, there's always this allusion to Christianity and to the Christian God but not so much that it overpowers any of the rest of the story kind of thing. So it's... Anyway, Song of Albion, highly recommended uh, for, for a really good fantasy series. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you have all the weapons and knowledge you need within you. God has blessings upon you. And I will see you on another episode of whatever the hell this is. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I should call the channel, whatever the hell this is. <laughs>